So actually, I, I'm very happy that I get the possibility to talk about a very different aspect of the Montague's Harrier to you too, because now we have heard a lot about all the protection schemes run in the different countries and how you put a fence and the chicks and whatever happens to the chicks. But as you can see here, this breeding season where we put so much effort into these birds only lasts about four months of the year. For the rest, the birds are about two months on migration and they spend more than half of the year in the wintering areas in sub-Saharan Africa. So this period, of course, is very important for these birds, for our birds, or maybe it's African birds we protect during summer, you could also say. And it's of course very important to know what happens in Africa and if we need or can protect them somehow there. So I'm going to summarize some of our results from research during, done during the last 10 years. And I hope that uh, there are some points you haven't heard before and that we have a, a nice discussion afterwards about both of or all of the seasons. So actually what was known like 15 years ago, not much. So we saw that the Montague's Harrier wintered south of the Sahara Desert, but there were very few ring recoveries even after 100 years of bird ringing because there are not so many birds ringed. And of course the uh, finding rate in Africa is not that high. So from 2005 onwards, we started to track Montague's Harriers using satellite telemetry where you get real time positions all year round. So you get less positions than the GPS trackers we heard about today, but you get them all the time, which makes a big difference for other questions. And the result, first published in 2014, was that we saw the migration routes and wintering areas of the birds from different breeding populations. So here on the map, we see that the Western European breeding birds migrate via Western route via Spain and end up in the Western part of West Africa. Birds more from a central region, there were only few tagged at that point of time, they used either the same Western route or a more central route via Italy which is also used by a lower percentage of the Western birds. And the more Eastern breeding birds, these are from Eastern Poland and Western Belarus. We heard about both areas already today. They end up again in the um, Sahel in West Africa, but more to the East uh, in the countries of Chad and Niger. So we have of course also wintering birds further East, but they breed even more East than this. On the way back, the birds from the eastern breeding population make a clockwise loop and go back to their breeding areas. The other birds mostly go back on the same routes as in spring migration, so via Spain, most of them. Uh, after some more years, the picture of course uh, gets fuller and fuller, uh, especially because the Montague's Harrier is not only dependent on thermals, so they don't cross the Mediterranean Sea at special points like Gibraltar. Some of them does, of course, do, of course, but most of them just cross where they are. So you get this broad scale migration pattern and you still see that the three migration routes, central, western and eastern, and even the birds uh, we heard about in eastern Belarus, close to the Russian border, they go to West Africa still. So this is really nice to see on a whole picture. But these satellite tags are also very useful to see where the birds die because they send continuously. You see if a bird lays on the ground and sends from one position or um, um, if it dies, uh, thus if it dies. And we see here on the map for three raptor species, the cases of death in autumn and in spring. And we have in yellow, the Montague's Harrier, in green, the Marsh Harrier, and in blue, the osprey. So this was a study done by Swedish uh, scientists and comparing these three species. But we see that in autumn, most of these birds die in Europe before crossing the Sahara Desert. But in spring, however, they die mostly above the Sahara Desert while crossing or being drifted out into the sea. So the spring migration seems to be difficult in the, in the desert. If we look at the number of deaths during the different months of the year, we clearly see peaks during the period of spring migration and autumn migration. So in, for, in our case, we have to look at the yellow for the Montague's Harrier, but the same is true for the others. And if 
you calculate then the daily mortality rate. So the chance that you die a single day, it's clearly highest in autumn and spring for Montague's Harriers, especially spring, then during winter and summer. That means on a migration day, your chance of dying is much higher than during a summer day or a winter day. However, the summer and winter periods are much longer in total. So if you correct for the number of days of these periods, you see that the total mortality of these periods is quite similar between summer, autumn migration and winter and only spring migration is a bit higher. So this is very interesting to know what happens to our birds outside the breeding season. <laughs> Finding the dead birds on migration is of course, of course a sad story. Everyone looks sad except for the photographer who liked the situation. But here the interesting point is that we followed one of the satellite tagged birds female from Denmark called Eben. Eben is also present in this uh, conference. And we found her in the um, northern region of the Sahel, uh, Sahara, Sahara Desert in Morocco and found out that she was predated by a um, desert fox. So she didn't starve or anything else, but she was predated during her migration in spring. Another very interesting point is that we got to know the key stopover areas of our migrating Montague's Harriers. So on the way in autumn, the Montague's Harriers use mainly stopover areas in Europe, and they are often places where other breeding populations are present. And also after crossing the Mediterranean Sea in the northern um, part of Africa. And this region, if you look at the map for spring, is very, very important. So the most important stopover area for the species in spring. On average, birds stop there for about 10 days in spring. So we saw this and we had several satellite tag birds. So we went there and wanted to find the bird. And the best example is our famous bird Franz, who was named after Professor Franz Bayerlein in Germany. And we were lucky enough to track him for five years. And in all these five springs, he made a stopover in this exact same area in Morocco. So going there, we were really, really happy to find him and really see him in this very different landscape, if you compare it to the Netherlands. And thanks to him, we found a roost of uh, marsh harriers and Montague's harriers, about 10 of each, um, sleeping in a cereal field which is much more extensive than what we were talking about today and then we had the possibility to collect some pellets in the morning and saw that these birds were eating nearly uh, completely larks and eggs of larks during the stopover in Morocco. This is really interesting so they were not eating voles or other um, small mammals but they were eating birds and bird eggs especially and we did a, a lot of monitoring of the prey species there and there were nine lark species breeding at that time and also six wheat ear species. So they are kind of in a paradise of eggs and, and chicks of, of larks where they feed on. Coming to the wintering range, we see that the birds all spent the winter in the Sahel zone south of the Sahara Desert. And this is really the open um, sparse vegetated zone before the area gets more forested further south in West Africa. So they really prefer the open landscapes also in Africa. And also following the satellite tech birds, here we have Mark, named after Mark Thomas, who was just uh, asking a question. And he wintered in Senegal and we went to find him there. And thanks to these satellite tech birds, you can also find roosts in Africa. And finding the roost is really, really, uh, really amazing. So it's, can be a, it can be two birds or 10, but it can also be hundreds or even thousands, which is really spectacular to see. So it's something you should do once in your life. And then you can count the birds on the roost. And again, in the morning, you can go and collect the pellets. And of course, the pellets are again, very important to determine what the birds are eating. Here, this is a pellet collection in Niger. And luckily there's a French, specialist Frank Noel who can determine the species inside these pellets and as you already see this doesn't look as voles or birds either these are mostly grasshoppers which are different to determine of course and if we look at the result of more than 5,000 pellets and 46,000 prey remains we see that the most important prey items by numbers are grasshoppers 
like 86.5% 86 of all the prey items the Montes Harriers were eating from Senegal to Chad. So they really depend on grasshoppers. And these are not the migratory locusts, but these are really grasshopper species like this Ornithacris here, seven centimeters in length, living in the vegetation every year. The Montagues Harriers have several distinct wintering sites during their winter stay. On average, it's three to four. So here we see an example of a bird staying in area one. Then it has two areas with, which are cl quite close to each other. But if you zoom in, you see that they're not overlapping at all. So he stays in site two and then moves to three and stays there before he moves on to site four. So these are really distinct areas and he's not roaming around in a wild manner. And this last area is where he stays until he departs on spring migration. And this pattern is true for all of the birds. They have on average three to four sites. The first sites are marked here in yellow. They are most northerly sites. Then the orange ones are the ones in between and the red ones are the last sites which are further south normally. And they can have one or several intermediate sites in orange here. And if we look on this graph, we see the date. So this is the whole winter from, end of, uh, from September to end of March. And we see how many individuals, the percentage of individuals that are in the first sites in yellow. This is, of course, in the beginning. Then birds start to go to the, the second site, so the intermediate sites. And then they decrease again. And then in the end of the winter, most of the birds are in their last site where they stay also the longest of the whole period. So the last wintering site is the most important for an individual in nearly all of the cases. What does the habitat look like in these wintering sites? So here we have the map of the first sites and we see that the main uh, uh, categories are natural vegetation. These are rough categories, of course, agricultural, landscape, sparse vegetation, and some other. So in the Northern Sahel, it's mostly sparse vegetation and natural, which is more than 75% uh, of the habitat they use. However, if you look at the intermediate and the last sites, we see that this red part has increased a lot. So in the sites further south, they use much more agricultural and natural habitats, especially the agricultural habitats. Interesting is to mention that they prefer sites with higher habitat diversity compared to random sites. So if you take a site of a harrier and you take just a site randomly on the map, the site where the harrier was is more diverse. So it's more mosaic landscape and not a large scale one habitat landscape. Same as we heard for some breeding parts too. And then another very interesting point is that the birds show a very high site fidelity. So between years, they use the same sites. So here we have an example of the male Edwin, which we tracked in five consecutive winters. And he used this first area for about one month every winter, then the second area for about one month. And then he went to his last area where he stayed four months. So this area is as important as the breeding area for this bird. He stays there the same amount of time which is really interesting to remember. However, it is, uh, the point is that these sites, they change over time. You have the Sahel region and it's the dry season when the birds are there. During this dry season, so the rain stop end of September, beginning of October, the birds arrive, it's very green, but then the area is drying out from north to south. So these birds are in the last area, which is furthest south, and it's getting drier and drier before they have to depart. And actually the question was already asked by Reginald Ernest Moreau in the 70s in his famous book. He was wondering how do these migrants that stay in the Sahel manage to survive there and even prepare for spring migrations while the conditions there are deteriorating? So we tried to investigate this question for the Montague's Harrier. And actually we just went to the areas where our tracked birds we're wintering and we counted their main foods, grasshoppers, and we took pictures of the area. So this is a tree where a bird was uh, roosting in during winter and the photo is taken in January, same tree, end of March. Deteriorating, so no question. But is this, uh, is this normal or, or is this just an extreme example? 
So we did the study at five sites in Senegal, Senegal, because it was the only country where you could just travel around without being captured or taking risk of other things. And we took five sites where GPS tracked birds were wintering and we did grasshopper counts on all these blue points and we investigated the landscape. And looking at these areas, I took um, satellite data from the normalized difference vegetation index that gives you the greenness of the vegetation. You can download the data uh, from servers and you can just see how green the area is at a certain point of time. And I did this for all these five areas in the year 2014 and 15. And you see that over the winter, course of the winter, it's getting drier. So the NDVI is getting lower. So it's wetter in the beginning and it's getting drier. This is also resembled by the same tree which I photographed in January and end of March. And I did the same with this tree in 2015, where you can see that it's also getting less green during winter. Interesting is also to notice here that there's a big difference between the years. So 2014 starts for most areas about here and 2015 starts at the point where 2014 ends. So it's a much drier winter and it's getting even drier. So there are very large differences between years in the wintering conditions for our harriers. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, we, we counted these grasshoppers to see if the food availability was changing during the winter. Maybe it doesn't matter if it's less green, but it does matter because these grasshoppers are depending on green vegetation, so they eat the green vegetation. And when the vegetation gets less, the grasshoppers do so too. And this was true for the number of grasshoppers per 100 meter in 2014 and 15. And you see that the mean values uh, changed from nearly 80 to 13 in 2014 and 34 to four in 2015. So there's a big decrease in prey abundance in time at the same point in winter. And there's a big difference between the years. So in a wetter year, there's much more food than in a drier year. And this is actually what Alexandre just explained to us that uh, also uh, influences the survival of the adult birds. If there's less rainfall, less green vegetation, less food, uh, sorry, here this side. And if there's more rainfall, there's more green vegetation and more food available. But what do the Harriers do with this situation? Does it matter to them or is it still enough if there's less at the end of the winter? Could be that they don't care. So we wanted to estimate their reaction to this decrease in prey abundance. And for this, we took the hours they were flying and these are the hours they are hunting in Africa because if they are not hunting during morning and afternoon, they are just very lazy sitting in the shadow and waiting until it's getting cooler again because they don't have to feed any chicks. They just have to care for themselves. So they just need to survive. And if we do this for Edwin, the famous male uh, in Senegal, we see that during the course of the winter, the hours he was flying per day were in, in the beginning around three hours per day. But then from January onwards, we see an increase in hours per day flying to the double amount of time that he spends hunting. So he really has to increase his hunting effort to sustain himself during the winter period in the end. And this is not only true for Edwin, but also for all the other birds that were wintering from Senegal to Chad. So it's not one area or one bird, but it's a pattern that is clearly visible for all the birds in their last wintering area. So it's at the same site, they have to increase their hunting effort going up and it's nearly doubling for most of the birds during the, this day. And interesting enough, here we come back to the greenness of the vegetation. So we have very dry, less green areas on the left and wetter, greener areas on the right. And we see here the hours of flying of the bird. You see that in dry areas, the birds have to fly more on average than in a wetter area. And that within an area, if it dries out, that, that the bird has to increase its effort. So for a bird, it's better to stay in a greener area than in a dry area or in a better year than an a drier year. So they have to work harder in drier areas. And this has possibly effects not only within the season, but carry over effects to the next season. 
and this is shown here, we have again the greenness of the vegetation and plotted here the spring departure date of the birds. And we see that birds in dry areas on the left depart later on spring migration than birds wintering in wetter, greener areas. They can depart earlier. And interesting enough, this effect is also visible at the arrival in the breeding areas. So the birds that depart earlier arrive earlier and the birds that depart late arrive late. That means if you winter in a dry area, you arrive late at your breeding site. Or if it's a bad year in your wintering area, you arrive late. And we all know that the first breeders are the good ones and that early arrival is very important for breeding success. So this is an interesting finding that the late wintering period might form a bottleneck during the annual cycle, because then they have to increase this work and they get delayed on migration. And actually, um, in, the, uh, in my PhD thesis, which was finished last year, we tried to uh, recalculate the numbers of mortality patterns, which were shown by Klaassen et al. before. So these are the same numbers birds tagged before 2011. We see again the total mortality of the birds, which is highest in spring migration and not very different between the other seasons, the daily mortality rates. And then I calculated the same numbers for birds tagged from 2012 onwards. So it's two different time periods. And you directly see that the total mortality in winter doubled and increased 1.5 fold during spring migration. And this is quite immense. We have to be careful with this result because it's based, of course, on not a very big sample size. There are not so many birds tracked every year. And it's also from different populations. But this gives a hint in the direction that something is changing in the wintering areas. The survival in the winter gets worse. More birds die in winter. And actually, if I look at this in the time of the winter, it's especially at the end of the winter when they have to work hard, that the birds die, that more birds die than before, and more birds die during spring migration. And that's not only because migration has get more difficult or worse. There are some years where there are very strong winds and things like that, but it can be also a carryover effect from the bad winter conditions that you then die on spring migration because you don't manage to cross the Sahara Desert. So this is interesting results and we have to to do work following up on this to understand what's happening to our birds. That the in Af circumstances in the wintering areas are deteriorating has always been the case. So we see here an example of uh, 1984, which I explained during the season it's deteriorating and it's differing between years. So we have greener years and, uh, and, and drier years. And as Alexandra already mentioned, the years of the great droughts are over it's raining more in the Sahel and it's greener, but it's the green consists of different vegetation. So it can be much more complicated than just looking at vegetation or rainfall. But uh, this goes too far into the discussion for now. The problem is, okay, there always have been dry and wet years, but many things changed. The percentage of agriculture in the Sahel increased by 57% during the last uh, decades. The livestock density has increased immensely. There are millions of cows and sheep and goats. And of course, you all know there's an enormous population growth of the human population, giving a big pressure to the country, countryside, which leads to habitat destruction in the wintering areas of birds. And of course, not only Montague's Harris, but all of the other long distance migrants wintering there and also local bird species. So what does that all mean now? quite simple, the safe winter is not that safe anymore. So we put a lot of effort in the breeding season, which is only four months, but the winter is getting more and more a problem for these birds. And if they don't come back in good enough condition or don't come back at all, our efforts might be in vain. So we also have to consider what can be done for a global conservation of the species like a flyway wide approach to protect the Montague's Harrier. And with that, I want to thank you very much again for your attention. And uh, I hope you have many questions and topics to discuss. And if you want to read many of these things, I'm happy to send you a PDF of my thesis.